Number two, there are five qualities of strength that can be trained at specific barbell velocity. So have you guys seen this curve or something similar? I disagree with it. I don't think it is actually a good way of working with VBT. So rigid velocity value. So you see absolute strength 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 0.75. These, these things have uh, absolute values attached to them. That was built on some college football data using a conventional squat, so pa below parallel squat, and a deadlift uh, conventional straight bar from the ground as well. Powerlifting stand lifts. Brian Mann invented these. He specifically left out the bench press because it broke his fixed velocity values. So he writes in his paper, he said, this is a system. So he said, hey, I use this. And what he really did was he had his athletes one day of the week, they would do strength speed training. So they'd, they'd do 0.75 to one meter per second on one day a week, and they called it the dynamic effort day. That was his only application of this that I can find. So he built this whole system to basically do a power day. That was all he actually did. So the idea, and not his fault, that he specifically said, this is my application, this is the niche I'm trying, this is what, and it gave his athletes this feedback and they then picked better loads and things like that. But the other VBT companies have gone, oh, well, you just have to train based on this. This is the universal method. If you just use this, everything else, you can ignore it. You can just work on your speed strength day or your strength speed day and hit these numbers. If you've ever benched with velocity-based training, it is almost impossible to do one meter per second without anything but an empty bar, no matter how strong you are. And that's just because it's only 35 centimeters of range of motion. There's just not enough time to accelerate the bar when we talk about mean velocity. So the idea that these numbers should apply to your rows, your trap bar, block pulls, cleans, squats, front squats, half squats, overhead squats, all these different movements have different velocities. So it's a misappropriation of the idea of the said principle. So you've got specific adaptation to impose demands. Like the speed of your bar doesn't drive adaptations. Your exercise selection, contraction type, sets and reps, these have much bigger impact on the results you'll get in your training than am I lifting at 0.65 or 0.75 meters per second. So not a big fan. Interesting as well, I've written a whole three part blog series which could itself be another book. Um, I go deep on this stuff, I'm a big training nerd. Um, <laughs> the naming convention is actually a broken translation of old Soviet terminology. Yuri Verkashansky, the inventor of the shock method. He's also the inventor of speed, strength, and strength speed. But when he wrote it, he was talking about the broader periodization structure for your athletes. So he would talk about his throwers doing more of a strength speed focused program while his sprinters did a speed strength program. He would talk about your program should be speed with a bit of strength or strength with a bit of speed. So it was about the entire program design, the periodization cycle that your athletes were in. Are we training a lot of strength with a touch of speed or a lot of speed with a touch of strength? So it's this vertical integration idea, but with an emphasis in the program. And so that's where that comes from. So yes. you're saying all of that is just people tying those two ideas to these velocities all this big misunderstanding. Yeah. It's just vague, vagueness in us throwing terms around. And like, if you talk to a client, so picture one of your clients in your head, pick your smartest client, and you go and start talking about these terms to them, does that help them or hurt them? It does not help. I talk to coaches and like coaches who love VBT and they go, they train with this and I'm like, okay, interesting. Tell me how you do it. And they'll go, oh, I'm doing speed strength. Is it speed strength or strength speed? I always forget. And these are VBT addicts. These are people who've got five devices in their gym and they've got all their athletes doing it and they forget. So clearly this is not helpful. Plus the idea of rigid numbers just doesn't work when we think about the said principle that we've talked about. And also oh, I've got, I had a second slide, but if we also think about, um, how that fits into the broader picture of everything else we're doing in training. So this is my alternative model. Three zones, speed, power, strength, also fit three variables. There's no set velocity numbers. The only number here on here that's fixed is 100% because you can't go above your, your current limit and 80%, which is, I believe, about the point where strength training really kicks in. For an intermediate to advanced lifter, 80% of your one arm, you need to be above that. You don't have to be going to failure at that, but you need to be lifting loads at or above 80% of your one RM. So, six RM weights, if you will. This fact's in three variables, like I said, the zones match your performance outcomes. So if you now say speed, we're training for speed, we're training for power, we're training for strength, athletes sort of get the intent, the intention behind the session a bit better. What's important within this zone system is not all exercises work in all training zones. There aren't really speed squats. There isn't strength sprinting. They're not really things that we can do. So things kind of fit within maybe a couple of ranges, possibly, but not really all three. We think about uh, the, the, the most force you can produce on anything, say an IMTP, isometric mid-thigh pull, 3,000 newtons, 5,000 newtons, big numbers there. Back squat, because of the extra range of motion, isn't gonna be as force producing as an IMTP, but it's gonna be pretty 
up there, working up to 1RM, maybe down into the power zone with say 50% of your body weight with maybe a one, 1 1.2 meters per second. Depends on the height of the athlete though. So different heights will have different velocity values. Power clean, maybe you could do a lower end strength power clean, but I'm not sure if that's a good idea. Um, but you might have it somewhere in your program as a, as a variant, as a way to adjust things. Then you've got bounds. You, know, you could have bounds where you're going for speed, really fast contact times, getting over the ground quickly, or bounds where you're going for distance. I want these bounds to cover three meters or three and a half yards per jump. And then sprinting can cover a continuum too. You know, hard accelerations, these are pretty powerful. Maybe even that could be a little higher up for some athletes who are actually more advanced sprinters, down to like top speed, flying 60 yard, 40 yard sprints efforts, up, tiny contact times, enormous amounts of velocity. And like things like, if we talk about upper body as well, baseball pitching might be up there. Med ball might be a little further along, bench press further along again. So using, if we use that, that bench pitching example, using bench to do speed bench for a pitcher, Let's throw things where we can release it. So use the movement type, the contraction type to drive the variables there as well. Does that make sense? Let's, let's break this down a little bit. <laughs> sure, yeah, sure. Okay, so you're saying there's no, so let's get rid of all those other names and ideas. So you're basically saying, you're basically able to change one of these three parts. Hypertrophy in there as well. So you've got to think about, like, this is only a two, it's only X, Y. So we've only got load and velocity or power on that, on the Y axis. So you've got to think about things like time under tension, tonnage, volume, those variables are on a third dimension, which is hard to draw on a slide. Right. So we, we have, this isn't complete, but if we're talking about training for performance, making people stronger, more force on the ground or more powerful, producing that force with, in a time constraint, this is kind of, yeah, how I would consider it. Got it. And these are just examples. Obviously, this isn't kind of everything. Yeah, you yeah, so strength. you could, uh, so snatches I'm imagining are between power clean and bounds. Probably somewhere, yeah, exactly. Maybe even down, like you can do like a really fast dumbbell snatch. But like if you think about sprinting, uh, a good sprint velocity is like nine, 10 meters per second. The fastest snatch I've ever seen was three and a half meters per second. So a third of the speed. So, so it's not even close. Barbell movements have an inherent limitation because they're closed. You go from here, snatch, you go to here, that's it. Sprinting though, each bound, each jump, each landing builds on the one before. So the ability to contract your muscles and have contact times under a tenth of a second, it's just like you can't snatch in less than a tenth of a second because each one resets, each one starts from zero. Whereas plyos, throws, they have like this momentum effect where they build and they get. So sprinting has to start from power to get to speed. You can't get to speed from anything. Baseball pitch has a wind up, which is slow and accelerates. So everything has to accelerate from kind of power into speed. Strength though, you can just like eccentrically lower the squat, drive out of the bottom, but it's gonna be slow. So you just can't do that. So you, so you are, are you gonna show us any data basically on some of the glyphs you've seen and some of the tests you've done? To... So these numbers here are kind of numbers that I'll work with a bit. Um, so yeah, so a, a heavy clean will kind of be one meter per second. These are all mean velocities here too. Um, IMTP, I put 3,000 up there, but that was a while ago. We've had some athletes smash that with five, 6,000 newtons these days. But yeah, back squat kind of maxes out around 0 0.3, 0 0.35. Trap bar deadlifts similar, about 0.4. Upper body tends to be slower, so a bench will max out around 0.2 meters per second. A lot of these numbers are in that field guide I sent to you guys as well. But, yeah, but you'll find different populations will have different numbers. Shorter lifters tend to be slower, taller lift lifters tend to be faster because they've got more time to move the bar, more time to create acceleration. Uh, so it's always relative. Yeah, it's relative. And you, like once you start doing this, you'll start picking up some patterns. Like you'll watch a single, that was heavy. Oh, yeah, it was slow. And then you'll learn what slow is for that population. Wrapping all that up, sort of putting it together, whether you're tracking velocity or not, you're training with velocity. Even doing an isometric is a deliberate absence of velocity. So this isn't stuff that's new or different. It's just we're now tracking it and putting values on it. And we can then prescribe objectively off those numbers. So instead of saying that looked fast, that looked easy, we can now say that looked fast, exactly this fast and we can give it a value, we can give it a target. Um, and so velocity tracking principles work in the existing frameworks. That's a pattern I'll keep coming back to. These frameworks can integrate with velocity. They're all, they work together quite nicely. Uh, this is kind of a build on from that as well. We've kind of already touched on this, the idea that absolute bar speed drives the specificity of your training adaptations. And it just, it, to a degree, like a power clean is faster than a squat, they'll have different adaptations. But the bigger variable was the clean versus the squat, not the actual speed of the bar. So exercise selection is going to be really important. Unilateral, bilateral, where the load is, technique, how you cue it is a really big variable. External cues, internal cues. Um, contraction type. So like plyometrics throws are just fundamentally faster than barbell lifts. So therefore, if you want really lots of speed work, get your people jumping, throwing, and sprinting. 
Intent, so velocity is contextual, so lifting as fast as you can relative to the current load, relative to your old bests is really important. Uh, and then set rep schemes, like the, the third dimension of that, X, of that graph is how much of the work are you doing, how much fatigue are you accumulating, how much recovery is happening in between sessions, all that kind of stuff. All these things matter, I think, more than bar speed. Bar speed just helps us make good decisions in this space, is how I would consider it. So velocity is contextual. A, a lift is only fast, so you know, what's a good speed? Well, it depends what your last set was. So last time you squatted 100 kilos, how fast was it? Now you're squatting 100 kilos again, now how fast was it? And also, did we do more reps? So did we do more volume? Do we want more volume? All those things come into this as well. So it, that's not new, that's not stuff you guys have heard for the first time, this is stuff you guys are already doing. Everyone in training is already doing. And so one of my favorite numbers in the entire metric app is this idea of the context number. So that's your velocity today, that's what it is compared to last time you did that weight. And in the future, we'll have things like compared to a 30-day average or compared to your all-time best. So you can start competing with yourself, start seeing how today's session is tracking compared to your own recent history uh, or all-time history, for example.